I would like to give a few words on maybe ways that we can bring these practices into our daily life. And in particular, I wanted to talk a little bit about wisdom and how we can live wisely in our daily life and how that can, of course, keep our spiritual life nourished and moist in the meantime. It's not as though, you know, once we're in the world, we don't have a spiritual life. The two need to be integrated. And there are very beautiful ways to integrate this. <coughs> working at any level <coughs> with any aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, a little idea came to me yesterday when uh, someone asked in the question time to Ben Blupeka, what is Buddhism in two words in a nutshell? And there are a few answers there, a few different answers. And I kind of put them all together and added my own and came up with a little recipe, which will hopefully bring more wisdom and uh, compassion into our lives. So the first in that little list is, what am I doing and why? Okay, you can say that's four or five words, but what am I doing is really sati. This is mindfulness, being aware of what we're doing. And the why is the sampajanya, it's the wisdom aspect. In other words, knowing the purpose, knowing the meaning, knowing why we're doing what we're doing. And that why can inject so much meaning and purpose into our lives. And the second one, is that everything changes. And this is a direct outcome of the first. Once we start to understand what we're doing and we start to understand why we develop that wisdom, that discernment, then we start to notice through that mindfulness that everything does indeed change. And I'm gonna go through these in more detail, but just for the beginning. The next thing that Venerable Pekka offered was don't react a two-word nutshell Buddhism. <laughs> and again, I'll flesh that out more, but it seems to follow on beautifully from everything changes. Where's the purpose in reacting to things that naturally are passing away? And my own two words to add to the rest as the last ingredient in the recipe is be kind. I think they would be my preferred two words to sum up the entire Eightfold Path because kindness is an expression of wisdom and it's also the way to that wisdom. It's the way that we live our lives. So what am I doing and why? Everything changes, don't react and be kind. It's just another way of talking about the Eightfold Noble Path, but I thought it's a punchy little way that you can kind of maybe remember and take home with you and practice at all these different levels. So many of you have spoken about your inspiration in the practice and the sense that you're touching into something really deep and meaningful, really profound with that potential to liberate, that potential to free. And to whatever extent we've practiced to, or however deep we think we've practiced, to some extent we have touched into a sense of peace and freedom. And the Buddha said there's so much more. I always ask the question why, from the time I could speak. And I think even before I could speak, my mom was probably preparing for the why because I was quite adventurous and would just kind of take off in different directions. Apparently I used to take my shoes off in the street. <laughs> When I was about two years old, I started walking like, or standing up anyway, about nine months. But then when I was about two, you know, she'd take me into town and I'd just sit on the pavement and take off my shoes and socks and, uh, and demand to walk barefoot. And apparently she used to um, kind of try and push me back in the push chair or whatever it was. And I'd go very stiff. I didn't want to go back in. So I was already a little bit challenging, perhaps, but I was asking why, you know, internally, why can't I walk barefoot? And those whys developed throughout my life to become a very big why in my teens as to why really that I'm here. It was the existential question that most of us are looking to answer and sometimes lose track of as we um, go through our lives. You know, we start off with a why that gives us a sense of inquiry, a sense of wonder, a sense perhaps of purpose in some way. You know, we have this sense we're here for a reason, but then the daily life can take over and we can forget our why. We can forget to live our why. But the why is really what gives meaning and purpose to life. It's our purpose in life personified and we have to keep it alive. So why do people take up the robes and uh, 
you know, it's very beautiful in the ordination ceremony. We actually ask a question. We ask to take up the training. We ask to renounce. And we do it in using particular words. We say, Sabba dukkha nisarana nibbana sachikarana taya kasaram kahetva pabajam deta me bante or deta me aye to a nun. And that basically means, will you give me the going forth, give me the yellow robe for the sake of the ending of all suffering, sabba dukkha nisarana, freedom from all suffering, literally translated, and nibbana sachikaranataya, for the realization of nibbana. And this becomes our why. This becomes the purpose of going forth. And even when we're swamped in the mundane nitty gritty of running a monastery or organizing retreats, that why is running in the background, giving a very, very clear direction as to the way we live our lives. It's not just about what we're doing, but why we're doing it, the purpose that's imbued therein. And for me, you know, when I think about uh, the meaning of my life, most of it is to end suffering, you know, and it's a beautiful perception. It's a beautiful container to have. And we can take that perspective, that perception into everything we do. You know, as monastics, when we eat, sometimes we reflect at the beginning of the meal. You know, I, I use this alms food not for fun, not for beauty, not for pleasure, not for fattening, believe it or not. <laughs> you can't help it if the body gets fat. <laughs> That's okay. But we take it only for the purpose of nourishing this body, for keeping it healthy and for living the holy life. And another little um, add-on to that, <clears throat> I think developed by Ledi Sayadaw, one of the great Burmese meditation masters, is that we eat seeking to pacify old feelings. In other words, abate or pacify the suffering that comes from hunger. But we only eat enough not to give rise to new feelings. In other words, feelings of being overfed, you know, bloated, or maybe sick if we have conditions, you know, that we shouldn't eat a certain type of food, but we think, well, you know, I just fancy a bit of chocolate cake today, even though I know I'm gonna suffer. But if we approach eating from the perspective of eating to end suffering, then it gives that eating a completely new meaning. And instead, we can be full of gratitude for the fact that we have a meal and we have a meal to help us live this beautiful spiritual life and keep the body alive as long as we can, keep it healthy for the sake of the practice. The body is our vehicle without which we have no chance to practice in this lifetime. We speak to end suffering. Is that possible? <laughs> So often we speak and cause harm, knowingly or unknowingly, you know, through speaking just a little bit too soon or speaking when our minds aren't really ready. They're not necessarily coming from a wholesome place. You know, sometimes we give advice or feedback to another person, feeling sure that it's in their best interest <laughs> and feeling certain that we know what's in their best interest. But perhaps it isn't the right time. You know, perhaps our minds are not full of loving kindness. And the Buddha said that it's very important to check this out. Of course, this is a practice that we often stumble with and fall down with again and again, because it is one of the hardest um, actions. It's something we do all the time. It's something that's interrelational. So we have our, you know, likes and dislikes. We want to not only control our own mind, but control everyone else's and control the way they behave. So we speak sometimes not necessarily with their best interest in mind. And the Buddha said, you know, it's not enough to speak what's true. He said we should, if it's true, but it's going to cause harm, not benefit, or it's even going to hurt the other person, then we should restrain. Even if that speech is true and beneficial, but it could hurt another person then we can say it, but only knowing the right time. So not when that person's tired or upset or feeling down about themselves or about life. Maybe we can wait for another time, you know, especially if it's something they might find difficult to hear. So we speak to end suffering, and that may mean limiting the amount that we use words, that we use speech. I don't know about you, but sometimes 
for me, if I'm going through a difficult time or if I feel alone in an experience, which is very easy being the first non, the only bikini living full time in the UK, um, and I express the difficulties or the challenges I face, I just want another person to hear me. I just want them to, to be open to understanding and just to say, oh, yeah, that does sound difficult. Or yeah, I can see that would be diff I, I can see that would be hard. You know, of course you're going to feel tired. Of course, it's natural to sometimes have doubts. I'm sure I would too in your situation. This is all that someone maybe needs to hear. But even more than that, just giving that non-judgmental listening ear to another can be such a beautiful gift. A gift that really allows the other person to feel seen to feel heard, to be believed, to feel believed and understood. You know, our worlds are different. They very rarely um, cross over. We all live in a way in our own little universe. And yet we're social beings and we do need that support. So sometimes we can minimize the amount we speak and just learn to listen in a non-judgmental way. And I found that that's extremely powerful for helping me work out whatever's needed and work out my own inner response to the suffering I might be experiencing from time to time. We can think to end suffering. Is that possible? <laughs> Certainly we can notice those thoughts of the inner tyrant that Venerable Pekka was talking about yesterday. We can recognize them and not start to criticize them. Oh, this is the inner tyrant. My tyrant's so bad. I'm so stupid for having a tyrant. Then you get on your own case, you become a tyrant to the tyrant. But instead, notice what's needed. Notice a compassionate response. You know, oh, this is difficult. You know, I'm hearing this voice and this is painful for me to hear. Even this morning, I had a, a voice of this inner tyrant. I only recognized it. Well, I recognized it quite quickly, actually, because it immediately gave rise to sadness. And that was because I had a big gastric flare up, as anyone in this room would know. <laughs> I commute. So you only hear like the very tiny bits that escape. But anyway, I had a lot of uh, pain in my system and a lot of gas. And so I went to lie down and uh, I said to Venerable Opeka, who was very compassionate to me, I said, oh, it's the kind of disease that must be disgusting to other people. And then I immediately felt really sad, like the tears came, you know, and I realized, wow, that's the voice of the inner tyrant telling me there's something disgusting because the body is sick, you know, and it's immediately a thought that needs to be discarded to end suffering, right? The Buddha said that some thoughts don't lead to suffering. Some thoughts are wholesome. And even if we think them for a whole day and night, there's nothing to fear. There's no danger therein. And those thoughts are thoughts of loving kindness, thoughts of non-harm. That was a thought of harm. That was a thought of violence to myself. And there are thoughts of letting go, thoughts of generosity, thoughts of giving, giving away, rather than controlling and possessing, rather than acquiring and attaining. What can I give to this moment? What can I give to this meditation? How can I use my life in the service of awakening? Not just use my life for my own small personal interests, but use my life in a way that benefits the people that I live with, the society around me. Maybe marginalized communities that you belong to or that you feel empathy toward. How can I be an ally to those that maybe don't always have a friend? So how can I use my life in service? And these are thoughts that are really beneficial to the mind. So we can have those kinds of thoughts. And it's possible to substitute the unhelpful thoughts that create suffering to the more beautiful thoughts that beautify the mind. Even further than that, though, silence. <laughs> and it's a sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. It's the Dveda Vitaka Sutta, I think. Majjhima number 90, where the Buddha says, you know, after distinguishing these two types of thoughts, the wholesome and the unwholesome, which is an aspect of wisdom too, he realized that even if he thinks these beautiful thoughts, although there's nothing to fear, and although they won't lead away from Nibbana, they will eventually tire the body and mind. And with that realization, he was able to let those thoughts subside. This is, of course, before he was enlightened and he was still practicing on the path like many of us. 
but you can be confident that you're in good company because even the Buddha struggled with thoughts. And it was a gradual kind of process of weaning off the unwholesome onto the wholesome and then stepping off from the wholesome into the beautiful peace. And that peace becomes infused with the qualities of those thoughts, the attitudes, the intentions, the dispositions of loving kindness, non-violence and peace. You know, when we rest, we can rest to alleviate suffering. That's what I did today. I went upstairs after the morning sitting and I just laid down on my bed, even though I had a talk to think about. I thought, well, what use is, am I, you know, if I'm just ill and feeling groggy, I better just rest the body. And I had the clear perception that I was doing this to alleviate suffering. And then that perception enables even rest to become a practice on the path. It becomes part of the noble path, a wise response to the truth of suffering and a way to the end. So we do these things out of compassion to ourselves, knowing the purpose, knowing the context, right? Sometimes knowing, especially when we're helping another, whether that person needs to be helped. You know, there's the classic example, and I haven't got a better one, of the old person crossing a road. And this gang of folks, I don't know, blokes maybe, decided they better go up to this old person and help them across the road. And so they took them across to the other side, very happy with themselves, before realizing actually the person hadn't wanted to cross. <laughs> so sometimes we jump in too quickly because we haven't had that mindfulness and that sense of what's appropriate in a given situation, in a given context. So we develop this wise discernment as an aspect of right view. And as the uh, mindfulness, the sati, the first part of that question, what am I doing, increases, then we can start to become more nuanced as to why and how. And as that discernment grows, meditation becomes increasingly easy because we start to be able to differentiate the wholesome from the unwholesome states. And as well as that, it's not only about alleviating suffering, we start to understand the difference between the happiness that leads to, let's say, craving and more bondage, more slavery to the senses, and the happiness of peace, the happiness of the mind when it becomes purified and quiet. And these are two very, very different kinds of happiness. And it's not that the Buddha was against happiness in any way. If you go to the Arana Vibhanga Sutta, probably one of my favorite suttas, but one I often quote, it's number 139 in the Majjhima Nikaya, uh, the Buddha talks about two kinds of happiness. And he says the happiness of the five senses is basically not to be pursued. It's ignoble, ordinary course. It follows the ways of the world. It's not leading to Nibbana. So remember in these teachings, these are not moral judgments, but the Buddha's goal is very clear. This path is about ending suffering for the sake of realizing Nibbana. And if we get stuck at the lesser, on the lesser pleasures, then we're missing out on all those subtle, refined pleasures of the mind. So we increasingly draw away from them and inward to the, peace, to the happiness of peace to the happiness of renunciation, of letting things go, initially letting them be, right? This is another way of letting go. I actually think the word letting go is misleading because it sounds like it's something we do, <clears throat> but letting go is something that happens as a consequence of having the right attitudes, of developing wisdom, developing calm. It's something that happens as the mind becomes empowered and starts to incline to that inner happiness. It becomes confident enough to drop the things of the world, to drop even the body at first, right? Parts of the body start to fade, but you're okay, you're safe inside. You have this beautiful metta, you have this sense of um, peace, and it's so alluring that you really can't resist. So these are the happinesses of the mind, and it's easy to see how this starts to end suffering and in a really beautiful, powerful way. So the question really with those two, uh, those two qualities, sati sampajanya, what am I doing and why, is about ending suffering. Is this leading to the end of suffering or is it increasing suffering for myself and those around me? Is my life being used? Is this moment being used in the service of awakening to whatever extent is possible right now? 
You know, we have to keep on the one hand a wide perspective on the path, right? The ultimate goal. But we can only get there through this moment, through a whole series of billions and trillions, and I don't know, billions of trillions of moments. And each and every moment counts. There's always a possibility to ask that question and bring ourselves on track. So when that mindfulness increases and the wisdom along with it, we start to see this second aspect that everything changes. Yeah, this is obviously one of the fundamental tenets of Buddhism. It's one of the three characteristics of life that not only Buddhists are able to observe, but is evident in nature, evident in our body, evident by looking at our mind, even for a moment, we can see that nothing stays the same. But even deeper than that, I would prefer to say everything is changing because it's changing all the time. And as we do direct our mindfulness to our body, first of all, we can actually see that things are in a constant state of flux and flow and change. You know, sensations in the body don't really last for longer than however sharp your mindfulness happens to be. You know, when the mindfulness is really strong, you can almost catch up to the arising and passing away of those feelings inside and see them come and go multiple times in a second. Everything is literally disappearing as we speak. You know, I had the perception when I was practicing in Myanmar, practicing with this a lot, with this perception of impermanence, that everything that I thought I could hold was like sand just slipping through my fingers, you know, or like sand banks on a river just falling, falling all the time. And when that happens, it's actually very difficult to react. How can you react to something which by its very nature is passing away? And this might sound a little bit, you know, theoretical or difficult to grasp, but we can start to sense this. We can start to see how our perceptions shift constantly. Obviously, we can see how our body is not as young, not as healthy as it was a few years ago, right? You may be one of those kind of fortunate people who's taken up meditation and got better sort of habits in your later life. But eventually, you know, your body's going to start grinding down, the bones are going to wear away. I even got a pain in my hip the other day, just as I thought lots of exercise was going to be good for me. And I realized, oh, my dad had a hip replacement. My mother's got sciatica. Hmm. <laughs> Surely I'm too young for that. But no, <laughs> you know, there's a wear and tear happening to this body all the time. And if we take these things for granted, we suffer more when they start to change. So, you know, Ajahn Chah had this beautiful simile. He said, um, I think he once held up a glass, not a glass of water like Ajahn Brown, but he held up a glass and said to his monks, I guess, because he didn't really have nuns except the white robe nuns. He said, uh, can you see the crack in this glass? And they're like, hmm, is Ajahn Chah playing with us? There is no crack. And they're like, no. He's like, there is a crack there, but you can't see it. It's already cracked. And this is very important to understand, right? The, the crack is inevitable. The glass is going to shatter and break. Does that mean we throw the glass away? <laughs> of course, you'd be a fool to do that. We don't throw people away. We don't throw, you know, things that we love away callously because anyway, they're impermanent. They're not me, not mine, not a self. No, but when we know the, gra the glass has a crack and that crack is only waiting to happen, then we exercise a lot more care, a lot more respect. We um, really make use of the glass you know, make use of our lives in a very wholesome way so that we don't have regrets when things change. Of course, in meditation too, sometimes we're loath to notice the change, especially when we're having what we think of as a good meditation. We don't want to see it change. <laughs> we want to think, okay, now I'm on track. Now I'm getting the hang of it. It's going to get better. I'm going to get this more often. <laughs> How can it last? How can it last forever? <laughs> but the Buddha said, everything changes. This was his unique teaching. Other religions talked about change. Other religions talked about suffering, even non-self to some degree. But the Buddha's unique contribution was sub-bay. All things are impermanent including the mind, including the most lofty and elevated states. 
And this is something we don't always want to hear, but if we understand that even perception, even mind consciousness is suffering, not clinging to it as suffering, is suffering by its very nature, then this is actually a beautiful teaching because even those things can fade away. Just near where the monastery is, uh, myself and Venerable Apeka have been taking lovely evening walks and we keep finding all these new little paths around the place. And uh, one of the paths leads into this beautiful valley called Chillswell Valley. And there's a house which is obviously very proud of itself because there's a signpost and it says Chillswell House on one sign and then right next to it is another sign it says all other houses <laughs> <laughs> in the opposite direction so it's like this big house that thinks itself very great and there's all other houses as if they're just the riff raff but I thought about that and I thought it's like a signpost and actually this might sound a little bit arrogant <laughs> but in a way we could put the Buddha's teaching on that sign we could say the Buddha's teaching this way all other teachings this way what do you think Actually, to a point, they seem to go together, to the point of perhaps even deep meditation, even mystic experiences, but they deviate in one way, and that is that the Buddha is giving us an end to all suffering. This is something unique. This is something that no other teaching went close to, and of course there was pushback even in his day. But this is something very beautiful because... Basically, we're starting to understand that we cannot hold on to anything and that any amount of clinging is causing us suffering, even if we cling to the most beautiful, lofty, noble of states. Mm -hmm. So even when we meditate, if we meditate with this perspective that we're sitting to end suffering, we're much less likely to cling. You know, there was this um, monk in the time of the Buddha named Venerable Asadji, and he wasn't the first um, uh, arahat under the Buddha. That's another monk. Um, but this person was very good at tranquility meditation. He was very good at getting into deep meditation, possibly fourth jhana, something, you know, very refined. And then he became sick and it came close to the time of his death. And he was really in a state of despair. And he said to the Buddha, I have regrets, I have regrets. And the Buddha said, why? What have you got to regret? Have you got regrets regarding your precepts? He said, no, no, I have no regrets there. And what do you regret? He said, well, formerly, when I was healthy, I could enter these states without any effort. I was very skilled in that. But now these things, um, what's the word? Uh, not delude me, what do you say? Evade me? I forget. Um, they're elusive for me. I can't get into them anymore. What on earth is going to happen to me? And the Buddha reprimanded him very gently and kindly with a teaching as well. And he said, you know, whenever did I teach that tranquility alone was the path, was the heart of the teaching? He said, no. These five khandhas, what we take to be a self, are you still identifying with the body as a self? Do you think that you are, that the body is owned by a self? Do you think that the body is existing within the self? And like this, he went through every kanda, feeling. Do you think feeling is a self? Do you think it's owned by a self? Is there a self within feeling, existing within feeling? Or feeling, does it exist within a self? Perception, will, consciousness itself. Is that me? Is it mine? Is it owned by me? Does it exist within consciousness? Is there some self abiding there? Or is consciousness abiding in the self? And he was smart enough, sharp enough through his previous practice to understand and actually was able to let go of his identification with these khandhas and become fully enlightened as he died. So this is really important, you know, and one of the ways that we can learn the third element of this talk, which I've now gone over time on, the not reacting, is to notice how when we don't understand that these things are not me, not mine, not a self, when we don't understand that these things are impermanent, changing all the time, and by their very nature they're suffering, then we react. Mm -hmm. So don't react is not a command, you know, but it's something that happens when we start to understand the arising and passing of all phenomena. It's really not 
possible to react when we see that these things don't belong to me. They're arising and passing as more quickly than we can even you know, keep up with, more quickly than we can even keep track. You must have noticed how you know, your perceptions change depending on your mood, depending on your feelings. If you have a pleasant feeling in the body or the mind, then you tend to feel really good about yourself and about everything else that's going on. Even listening to a talk. I was speaking to Venerable Pekka on our walk yesterday and we were saying, yeah, this talk was really good, but I think that's probably because I was having nice meditation at that time. And this talk seemed a bit scatty. Maybe that was because my mind was scatty. And that's the way it is, isn't it? We see everything, we perceive everything in light of our own mental state. And, you know, another person can look completely different depending on our mood. When we're in a good mood, we think, oh, you know, they're not so bad. Their faults are quite cute. Mm -hmm. It gives them a certain idiosyncrasy. You know, they're kind of quirky. They're really good fun. But when we're in a kind of more irritated mood, we don't have much bandwidth because we're tired, then all those kind of habits, it's like, not that again. They always do this. <laughs> and we forget about change. We forget about impermanence. And we forget about how even the mind is conditioned. So when we start to learn not to react with greed and hate, we start to restrain our mind, we can find a new response. And that response, of course, is being kind. The last of these four that I want to talk about today. And the kindest thing we can possibly do, I think, is to walk on the Eightfold Path. Why is the Eightfold Path right view, right motivation, Right action, speech, and livelihood. Right endeavor. Right sati, mindfulness, and right samadhi. Why is it right? It's right in the sense that it leads to the end of all suffering. It leads towards nibbana. And in that sense, it's right. So the kindest thing we can possibly do for ourselves is to allow ourselves to disappear, allow the path to take over our life to live our lives initially aligned with that path, but eventually that sense of agency starts to disappear and take, it's taken over because it's the only thing to do. When we realize what's for our benefit and what's for our harm, then why would we want to harm ourselves or another? And I think almost as important as walking the outfall path is how we walk that path. And the way to walk it is to walk it kindly. And I don't mean with a little bit of kindness, I mean with immense kindness, immense gentleness, immense patience, because that's what it takes. Yeah, patience is an aspect of being gentle. Patience is an aspect of wisdom. We understand all we can ever do is put causes in place, but we can never uh, bring about the results. We can't force them. No more than we can force a flower to bloom or a tree to grow. It grows dependent on the weather, the conditions, whether or not there's an infestation of some insect or, you know, whether there's enough water, whether there's, I don't know, so many little conditions, different conditions that, you know, we simply cannot control. And we too are like a tree. We're an aspect of nature. We're no different, you know. We thrive when conditions are wholesome and healthy and suitable for us. We struggle when they're not, and those conditions will be different for different people at different times. So how can we ever judge? You know, whatever we see in another person is simply how, it's a product of the conditions working on them. Even deeper than that, is there really a person these conditions are working on, or are we just a manifestation of conditions? Just a conglomeration, <laughs> conglomeration of elements. That's all we really are, of these five khandhas and their different uh, permutations, shapes and forms. Right? That's all we're seeing. We're not seeing a person. We're just seeing the product of conditions and conditions constantly changing, constantly in a flux and a flow. So we cannot judge another because we simply don't know what pressures they're bearing. We simply don't know them in another context. Maybe they'd be an altogether different person. But what we can do is try to create those conditions as beautifully as possible for ourselves and for others by adding kindness to everything we do. 
you know, this is really the teaching of the Buddha. We cannot control the outside world. We cannot, you know, have everyone behave in a certain way. We can vote. We can, you know, put our kind of mouth where our values are, put our action where our, our values are. But we can only do so much. We're one individual among billions in this world. But what we can do is make every moment as kind, as gentle, as harmless as we possibly can and trust trust that the results will be beautiful and the results will come in their own time. The only mistake we can really make in life is to forget our why, to forget the purpose of our life, to lose our direction and to stop practicing. But even then, don't worry, because I actually think everyone that's got this far, the Dhamma is within you, it's been embedded, the seeds have been planted in very fertile soil. And that soil, you know, may be really deep. You may have a lot of soil in there. Maybe the seed is buried deep down. But eventually, you know, as the mind stills and gains samadhi, gains in tranquility, it will kind of uh, sink down to those seeds and start to stimulate their growth. And all those wisdom seeds that have been planted by the Buddha, by our teachers, by everything, or at least all the good things you've read. Read the suttas. This is wonderful input, even if you don't understand it now. Eventually, when the mind becomes tranquil, those seeds will start to grow. And you'll find that, you know, enlightenment is there. It's inside. It's, in a sense, all we have to do is uncover the delusion. And I don't mean it's there as a state. <laughs> you know it is not a state of mind it's a disappearing act but the more that we can uncover you know the hindrances to wisdom the more that wisdom can flourish and grow and the more we can have a chance to see things as they really are and really what we learn is that you know everything is subject to cessation and that's a brilliant message when we realize that everything essentially is suffering <laughs> This is maybe a bit, I hope this isn't deep and depressing or anything like that, but I think, you know, the more we realize suffering, the more we, in a sense, have reached the edge of despair, the more strongly we're motivated to seek that end, and that's going to propel us on the path, and we do it with kindness every step of the way, and this becomes the meaning of our lives. So I don't know if there were really many practical tips there for your daily life, but the main thing I want to convey today is that we can uh, practice the path in any way, whatever you're doing in your life. You have to be either acting or having a livelihood or being still or speaking or having some kind of view, having some kind of mindfulness. So even if you don't get to meditate as much, you still can develop the path of right livelihood, right action, right speech. And you can continue to live your why. Keep getting at the heart of what you're here for, why you're doing this, and how your actions can actually go for the alleviation of suffering, not only for yourself, but for all beings. And eventually that will lead you to Nibbana. So... That is all for me. <laughs> and I hope that we may be able to have a little discussion now. Does that sound good? Are you up for that? Yeah, excellent. So the way this will work is that our dear host, Matthias, I think, will make some breakout rooms and he'll put maybe four of you in each room, something like that. And uh, you can have a little chat about perhaps whatever you want. But I mean, I could give you the question why? <laughs> or you could just share something of your retreat experience with one another. So the idea is to uh, just give space to listen to one another, maybe have a couple of minutes each to share. And the others can just hold space kindly, just give that person the chance to express themselves from their heart, whatever they feel like sharing, and then the next person can do the same. So at one time you're speaking and another time you're listening and just see how that goes. And then we'll come back into this room and, uh, and just share how that felt for you all. Okay, so welcome back. <laughs> yeah.
one minute you're in the meeting with a few people, the next minute, bang, here you are again. Within a few seconds, it's amazing how we move through space and time. <laughs> and we also had a very nice little conversation here in the Dhamma Hall where we're here with three other people. And uh, yeah, they also felt like part of the, what did you call it? Stage set. <laughs> 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 but part of the retreat. And I definitely felt very, very supported by the people here. It was absolutely wonderful. So um yeah, I, I wanted to end with a meta meditation, but first it'd be lovely to hear any feedback from the groups. And I don't know if you can actually unmute yourselves or not, uh, because we haven't been speaking to each other yet. It's possible that you can raise your hands and um, I can unmute you. Otherwise, you're very welcome to write anything in the chat about the retreat in a couple of words or about how it was to meet one another. Even if you have any questions, I can probably handle two or three. Um, time is running out, but we'll have other online sessions, regular sessions after this. So it'd be lovely to hear voices at this point if you want to raise your hand. Or right in the chat. <laughs> Is there any Q&A there or not? Ah, I see, you can't write directly to me, isn't it? Can you? Well, you're welcome to write directly to me at this point. Otherwise, it'll take too long to write via Annie. Yeah, we'll just do direct to me. So let's have a look. Uh, all I hear is, yes, I'm here from Annie. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, a last question. There were so many good practices in this retreat, but out of your personal experience, what's the best advice you can give when we have digestive issues? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for this unforgettable days. Ha, ah, interesting. Um, I'm not sure my practice changes very much depending on digestive issues or not, but I use a lot of metta, loving kindness in my practice in general. And I think if anything, I just have to be a lot gentler and um, less demanding of my body when I'm sick. Yeah. I can notice that the most difficult part of being sick and not being able to meditate is the fear that sets in. Oh no, I'm a non. I want to sit not just for an hour, I want to sit for like hours because my mind's ready to go. And you know, sitting at the moment seems to make it worse. So what's going to become of me? And this is really a lot of suffering. So I think being really kind to those thoughts, trying to change them into compassionate thoughts, trying to be really, really gentle, changing the posture, doing more walking meditation, today lying down. Um, and also, of course, you can do the wisdom practices of this is not me, not mine, not a self. This is the nature of the body. And uh, there is this lovely sutta. Yeah, now it's not quite related to health, but it's a nice sutta in the text, which talks about somebody who wanted to go and practice in a very dangerous place. And the Buddha said, well, what if they, you know, throw stones at you? And then he said, well, I'll be glad that they didn't throw knives at me. Well, but what if they throw knives at you? Well, then I'll be glad that they didn't kind of beat me with a, I don't know, cut me up with a saw. <laughs> but what if they do cut you up with a saw? Well, then I'll be just very grateful that I didn't need to seek an assassin. <laughs> hmm. So many people have to do that. They're coming to the end of their lives. They don't want to live anymore. And here I'm getting it for free. <laughs> but that's just to put it into perspective and to say that there's always something working in our body. Okay, we have digestive issues, but at least you don't have, I don't know, lung cancer. I hope you don't have lung cancer. If you have lung cancer, well, at least I'm, I'm not dying yet. If you're dying now, well, at least I heard the Dhamma and I can die with Dhamma in my heart. So it's really important to be grateful for the parts of our bodies that do work and not to allow ourselves to get too hung up on the digestive issues. I do notice that if I'm particularly sick, I don't actually want to think or talk about it because it just stimulates this kind of panic thing. Um, 
So for that time, I just need to almost bide my time and see if I can keep my mind in wholesome states, do some service, you know, practice in different ways, be kind to somebody, um, think about spreading the Dhamma, whatever it might be. And when the time opens up, when I get the green light from my tummy, then I can sit again. So it keeps you very in the moment. But my general advice for everybody in practice is do more meta meditation. You can't get enough. It's not superficial. I just had a letter from America saying that the advice I gave them to practice meta seemed like oh, it's only touching the surface until they practiced it and it's transformed their practice completely. It's a wisdom practice. Thank you very much for this lovely, inspiring, ugh, lovely, inspiring retreat with Ajahn Brown, Van Chanda and Van Upeka. It enabled me to recollect some important points I've forgotten. I'm thinking of living by the eight precepts on a daily basis. Please give advice. Wonderful retreat. Thanks to you and the volunteers. My advice for eight precepts is to focus on the singing, dancing, entertainment. Uh, not using luxury items, but not necessarily focus on the food, because many times when people talk about eight precepts, they mean I'm not going to eat after 12. This is very difficult in the lay life because you're busy. And if you have digestive problems, you might need to have something to eat in the evening. So it isn't so much, you know, what you put in your mouth. Ajahn Brahm says this, it's what comes out of your mouth. That's the important thing. <laughs> it's not unethical to eat in the evening. But what you could try to do is simplify, just be kind to your body and just see if, you know, if that, um, if you can reduce a little bit and if that feels healthy for you and sustainable, great, but don't get too fixed to it. Otherwise, maybe try and do it a few times a week. You know, maybe not, don't give yourself too high a bar. It's not going to make all the difference in your practice. But the entertainment and the singing, dancing, especially going to pubs and stuff like that, that will make a difference because that really stirs and agitates the mind. Hmm. Someone's asking, how much is the plumber bill? I'll provide for the payment. Thank you so much. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. We do have a, another bill coming soon for the water softener. So the best thing to do would be to contact Minori finances at she can probably put her email address in here and she will let you know it's not going to be a sixteen thousand plumbing job thank goodness <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very very much i think it's more of a service this time to this water softener that's really so kind <laughs> this was my first retreat i enjoyed it and learned a lot thank you very much to the whole team thank you thank you thank you including to annie matthias all the organizers to help make it happen, I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Deep bow of appreciation. Okay, now I'm gonna to come to Suzanne who has her hand raised. Can you unmute? Hello, venerable Chanda. Hello, Suzanne. Hi. Yeah, well, I wanted to say in person to, um, I'm so grateful that you, uh, you organized this retreat and I feel really, you know, like so blessed, you know, by these wonderful, uh, wonderful meditations and inspirations. And um, um, yeah, I, I do feel, I don't know how it's going to gonna unfold, but I feel really like s some weight has been lifted off me, you know, and I'm, I feel so free and just, you know, I feel like, we just want, wanting to share share you know love and and uh be be um some yeah give kindness that's you know what Ajahn Brahm said uh I was asking also about the eight precepts you know number one it's uh, be kind yeah. <laughs> so I feel I really feel inspired by this mm. and but I you also talked about the eight eight precepts and I'm I was thinking about it you know what is like, cause it was too good for me, you know, uh, keeping them in the retreat. And I'm thinking, okay, which ones are helpful? And yeah, thank you for talking about it again. And I will investigate it. But yeah, being kind, for sure. I will practice this one. Wonderful. Thank you for the feedback and yeah, for your practice. Isn't it wonderful that people want to be even more kind? Imagine if everyone was that bit more kind, there'd be so much more kindness in the world. Yeah. 
I, I never do this, but I'm quoting a Christian person now, Mother Teresa, who said, we're not expected to do great things. We, we should just do small things with great love. And that's really nice. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the precious treasure of feminine energy, even in teaching Buddha Dhamma. Thanks for your spacious hearts, Venchanda and Venupeka. Thank you for your clear teachings and guided meditations. <laughs> I really loved your interview with Jetsunma Tenzin Palmo. I think that interactions with other nuns from other Buddhist traditions adds, uh, adds to the inspiration and sense of wider community. Do you plan any pilgrimages to India to meet her and other key places that perhaps our supporters could also join in? Ooh, <laughs> I would love, I lived in India for the best part of 15 years. So India is my home, actually. I won't even just say spiritual home. It's like the only place I ever felt was really home. I don't know, there's many lives there, I think, conjecture, but I think it's, yeah, very strong connection there. So it's a dream for me to go back to India, but it will depend on my stomach. The reason I don't live there is because of visas and stomach issues. So, um, but I would love to do that someday. And I do think it'd be great if uh, our community could organize some kind of pilgrimage. It's a bit beyond me because <laughs> I'm organizing far too many things already, including running a monastery, running a trust, uh, running all these retreats and doing most of the teaching. So, um, but if anybody else has ideas, that would be great. And I think, uh, I mean, Jetson, uh, Jet Sunma is obviously a very, very special practitioner. Um, so yeah, she's kind of one of a kind. She's actually more senior than Ajahn Brahm, can you believe? In, uh, in I think in overall monastic years. So really inspiring person. <laughs> All good ideas. All right, anything else anyone would like to say? Maybe just a word in the chat about how you're feeling now. You can write it straight to me if you wish. Um, just a word to describe it. And you don't have to feel good. Actually, there's no good or bad. We're looking for descriptions here. Calm, uplifted, gratitude. Oh, silent, yay. Any, anyone in the room? Grateful, lighter, free, grateful. Very inspired, grateful. <laughs> Lots of lovely emotions. Feel. <laughs> Peaceful, even with a lactose intolerance. Excellent. Bless. Oh. <laughs> Joy. Thank you for an amazing retreat. Can we have more Zoom retreats, please? The Zanukampa retreats are brilliant. Venchanda's end motivation talk is the tonic I needed to get me going now. Also, it was lovely talking to Jen and Margaret in the chat group. Feeling absorbed, somebody else. And uh, one message. Thank you so much. So grateful for all the teachings. As someone already pointed out, please keep these Zoom retreats going. They've been very helpful to keep on the path. Well, I don't know if this is a positive or a negative, but next year, Ajahn Brown will come. And uh, we actually do think it will be an online retreat because there simply aren't any places we can really hire out in the UK. But what I'd love to do is have, say, a five or six day online retreat and then have some, like have an in-person weekend retreat. And I'm hoping people will be able to do both. So it could be possible that we do the online retreat and then you can fly over to England for a live retreat, like a kind of, what do you call that? Like a, an encore. <laughs> <laughs> we won't sing, but it will be an encore. Well, we might sing. Uh, <laughs> and to have some talks and things as well. But it will depend on the time, but it will probably be this time next year. It will depend on the time as in when we can get the venues organised. But we'll do a bit of both. And I am thinking online retreats, they make sense, you know, in the light of the cost of travel and the shortage of retreat centers, the accessibility for many people. And it can be just as good, if not better, than a real so called real in person retreat, especially when we start to meet one another outside of these retreats. Hmm. Okay. Dear Venchanda and Ben Upeko, it's hard to find the words to express the depth of my gratitude for your kindness and compassion. 
Meditation in your presence is deeper and your wise words bring peace and contentment to my heart. Completing this retreat, I feel like I'm in the warm zone of metta that I'll try to preserve and share with people around me. Thank you so much. <laughs> I feel like we're taking a bit of the cred there that really belongs to Arjun Brown because the minute he comes in, it's like, vroom. There's a, such a sense of, for me anyway, maybe it's because I need someone to lean on, right? There's just a sense that everything is well in the world. <laughs> but that's really good that you can feel that from the bikinis too. We have, we do care. We do care. I will accept that we feel compassion for ourselves and for all of you, especially all of you. Self-compassion is harder to come by still. This retreat has pressed my reset button. Thank you so much to the venerable monastics and all volunteer support, as well as the presence of other participants. <laughs> so the dates for Ajahn Brand's visit will be out in our newsletter after we arrange them. <laughs> we don't give the dates before then because it just brings up too many inquiries and our admin teams get swamped, but it will be somewhere in June. Ah, may the supporters catch the same plane and <laughs> continue the retreat on the plane as a way to the live retreat. That's very cool. You have to have a meeting point in Europe somewhere. Thank you very much for a lovely retreat of this opportunity to practice meditation. I had a strange thing that happened. I didn't have any dreams during the retreat. Maybe my mind was having a rest as well in sleep. Excellent. When a jump ram is great, but I'd love to be on your evening walks with Benny Becker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't go on an evening walk with Ajahn Brahm because he doesn't walk very far. <laughs> so yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> okay, well, let's uh, just settle down now after those lovely sharings. And once again, come inside. I think it's quite nice actually to have the interaction first and then to remember how it can feel to make that transition. Because this is what we'll be doing in our daily life. Establish your practice in daily life. It may be different from practicing in a retreat, but no less beneficial. In a sense, that's where you do the real work. So just noticing any reverberations in the mind <clears throat> from the sharing, conversations, the words, and noticing the beauty of peace, the simplicity of the world when we close our eyes. <clears throat> and just listen. Listen inside. And as a way to begin engaging gently and kindly with the world. <clears throat> the world in our hearts and the world's outside. I'd like to invite all of you to join me on a guided metta meditation. If you have your own way of practicing, that's perfectly fine. If the metta doesn't seem to gel right now, then just be kind to your body and mind. Keep it simple, keep it natural. And if you wish to, if it feels natural, Join me on this little journey as we begin spreading metta to our bodies and minds before spreading it outward. 
So just connecting to any feelings in your body. And inclining to those feelings or sensations that are fairly pleasant or easeful. Easy to be with, maybe the touch of the skin, the atmosphere, perhaps a gentle breeze, or a tingling feeling. Sometimes we have a tingling feeling in the palms of the hands on the soles of the feet. And just allowing yourself to soak in those feelings that are agreeable or neutral right now. Perhaps a mental sense of lightness or joy. Feeling of gratitude. And allowing yourself to linger with that. And wish yourself well. If you wish, you can use words of loving kindness, such as, may I be happy. May I be free. May I be healthy. May I be at peace. Whatever you really wish for yourself. Freedom from suffering, contentment. Peace. Perhaps you even imagine yourself experiencing these qualities right now. Allowing them to soothe and soften any aches or pains, any emotions Noticing that even if your mind is not quite how you wish it would be, still, there can be contentment, there can be peace. Just imagine soaking up these blessings, these well wishes. And sensing in to the well-wishing, the goodness in this virtual or actual room. Allowing yourself to receive loving kindness. Allowing yourself to be at ease.
And now spreading thoughts and feelings of goodwill to everyone here right now who you've been meditating with for the last few days. It's as though the loving kindness in your heart is radiating with a golden hue, golden light, and that's filling up this virtual space. May all of us be happy. And keep walking on this beautiful path. May we be free. May we be at peace. Feeling these thoughts and feelings start to build and spread beyond this room, beyond our own little homes and out into the world. To all beings in the neighborhood, in the village, in the city, in your country. As though there's a beautiful golden light shining outward from you into the whole area where you live. Whether you're in Germany or Poland or Argentina, UK, Imagine the whole world and all of these beautiful golden lights shining across their own area and spreading beyond there until they join up like a beautiful golden glow across the whole planet Earth. Evenly, powerfully, including all those places where there's conflict or war, hunger or drought, places where people are on the whole safe, going about their everyday lives. May all beings in this world know the purpose of their lives and live kindly, compassionately. A life that benefits themselves and all those around them. Imagining this meta actually bringing peace to the world. And allowing the meta to spread and include all non-human beings, all the animals, the insects, the birds, 
all the creatures in the seas, the lakes, the rivers, underground, the little moles in our garden, the foxes that chase them, trying to dig them up, the owls, beautiful birds, and even those insects we regard as pests. All beings who breathe, may they all be happy and safe. All visible beings as well as invisible beings, beings in other realms. Beings who are alive right now, beings yet to be born. May all beings share this beautiful, peaceful, loving kindness. May their hearts be free. Imagining this meta just spreading to infinity, outwards and unbounded. We from hatred and ill will into the universe, the galaxies and beyond. Until the whole universe is meta itself. The stars that twinkle in the nighttime sky Twinkle with benevolence and all those beings who are maybe asleep right now. And the sunshine illuminates the whole universe. Now gently bringing your mind back into your room, your body, perhaps into your heart, feeling how much lighter, softer, more at ease you've become. And lastly, offering yourself the gift of forgiveness. Whoever I am, whatever I've done, in pursuit of happiness, sometimes out of ignorance, not knowing any better, but doing the best I knew how. May I forgive myself fully. Or may I learn and commit to forgiving myself in time. And if there's anyone who's hurt or harmed me, 
I can recognize they too did this, not knowing any better at that time. If I'm able to forgive them, I offer forgiveness. Or I offer my intention to forgive, knowing it will take its own time. And if there's anyone I have hurt or harmed, knowingly or unknowingly, I seek their forgiveness and wish them well. Sabe Sabe Pana Sabe Buddha Sabe Purgala Sabe Atta Bawa Pariapana Sabe Itio Sabe Purisa Sabe Aria Sabe Naria Sabe Dewa Sabe Minusa Sabe Winipadika Awe Rahontu Abya Pajahontu Ani gahontu Sukiatanam pariharantu Dukha munjantu Yadalata sampadito Maure gajantu Kama Saka so For those who know the three sadhus, then that's the three big sadhus to almost end this retreat. <laughs> Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. <laughs> okay so that was a little bit short for the meta but hopefully a nice end for everyone and uh, if you do have another five minutes or so to hang on i'll talk about uh, what's coming next you may be seeing you very soon um and before that i think Manori is going to say a few words on how you can be involved and support us from here. So, whoops. Hello, I have put a lot of um, links and information in the chat box. And uh, what I wanted to, um, I wanted to guide you towards the website towards our YouTube channel, where you can get the regular teachings and the past recordings as well. And um, 
But uh, now a little bit about Anukampa Bikuni project. Uh, you may be knowing what it is or not. It is a um, charity in the UK and uh, Venerable Chanda set it up um, about eight years ago. Um, she was sent by Ajahn Brahm to set up the Bikuni Sangha a Monastery Avihara um, and help women in the UK to ordain um, and um, not only ordaining, it's my personal experience being with the bhikkhuni is so much difference and um, you get so much information. Um, there is a, there's a big difference between a male and a female monastic and there is a bit, big difference between um, for, a, for a woman to, you know, go and talk to a bhikkhuni. So there's so much of, um, so much of um, advantages for men, women, everybody. And it is giving equality to everybody as well. In this day and age, uh, it shouldn't be unacceptable. It should be unacceptable not to have the goodness, I think. So, so how can you support? Um, I have put some links how to donate. And uh, so with your donations, we maintain the uh, Vihara um, and support um, uh, the Bikuni. Uh, requisites, medicine, uh, travel, and these kind of teachings. Um, and uh, there's so much of uh, free teachings, regular free teachings as well. And then we give a little experience for the women who want to come to the monastery and uh, see whether they want to be a bhikkhuni and see how that life is. Or if you don't want to be a bhikkhuni, but you want to set up, you know, get, you know, uh, uh, train a little bit towards that side, you know, so, so much of training is there. So all those things are supported. Um, and with your donations and also uh, the upkeep of monastery, the utility bills, the council bills, um, maintenance, plumbers, water, all kinds of things. So um, all your donations are very gratefully received. And uh, we have our accounts published in the Charity Commission and um, all the details are there, so transparent for you to see. Um, and uh, if you want to volunteer, I have set up another link, put another link as well. Uh, you can uh, email team at anukampaproject.org. Uh, and uh, then if you want to uh, do a dana, of course, uh, Venerable Chanda will be leaving for her vasa soon. But uh, once she comes back, uh, you can do that as well. There's so much of information in our website. And I think the best way is to subscribe to a newsletter. So you'll get regular, um, regular information on what is happening. And while Venerable Chanda is away, there will be teachings happening, there will be so, so many uh, teachings from Bikunis and Ajahn Ramali. So um, it is, um, you know, very, very um, informative and uh, useful to subscribe to the newsletter as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manoi. Could you add all those links again at the bottom here because they're quite far away? And uh, yeah, just to say that, you know, the idea of a monastery is not only for monastics, it's a place of spiritual community that can hopefully serve a huge community and give us all a sense of um, connection and spiritual belonging as well. So, you know, I feel really pleased that um, we have a gender inclusive monastery. You know, it's not only for women or men, but also gender non-binary folks and transgender folks. We're trying to bring transgender ordination into the Sangha. We don't know how that's going to go yet, but it's happening in some places, at least the preliminary steps. And, uh, you know, this is one of the benefits, I think, and one of the ways we can transform suffering into compassion is by um, trying not to replicate systems of harm, you know, trying to um, avoid, um, you know, harming others in the ways that we have been harmed. So whenever I experience suffering in my life, I realize this is an opportunity to learn. It's an opportunity to learn how to be, um, you know, how to bring more compassion towards those areas that are 
important to me and that I can understand others suffer with too. So it's a very uh, diverse community and a very friendly community. So if you are in England, it's easy to get involved. And if not, you're welcome to come and stay. So, um, and we also have lots of online teachings. In fact, Friday evening, we're having a sutta discussion. So if you want to join that, you're very, very welcome. We're right into the suttas now. So some of the deeper um, points of the teachings, but we have it as a discussion, not as a class. So it's quite a special opportunity to, um, to apply it to our lives. And I know many of you do come to that, but it would be great to get more of you coming as well. I am going away, as Manoi said, for my annual days retreat in Perth. And also Venerable Peck is going to be in the nuns monastery there. So we'll see each other. Um, but uh, that means I won't be giving any online teachings, but there'll be something every week for all of you, something with a bikuni who is a friend or someone I know and is trusted by me. So I think really um, our YouTube channel is probably the place to find teachings by bikunis. There aren't many bikunis in the world, but um, whoever there is, <laughs> I try to get them to teach um, so that they can share some of their wisdom. It's so rare to hear uh, female monastics. And I think we need to see ourselves represented to feel that it's a real opportunity or possibility for us. So, um, yeah, I think that's more or less all. We are a charity, so you will get gift aid on any donations. And Manori usually mentions, I think, about um, stunning orders as well. That's another good way. And we will have a few projects next year, like having an outdoor office space. We don't have a proper office space except a moldy little space in the corner of the garage, which one of my friends says, you cannot go there. <laughs> you must not go there because it's damp. And... Um, yeah, we have a little hut and we also have a little shed on the land, both of which are quite mouldy. So we need to do renovations, if not establish something from scratch. So um, it's going to be exciting. And I really hope to see all of you here someday. You're very, very welcome, especially next year. We'll have places next year. Some of you are already registered to visit. So if you want to do that, also, you can write to team at alucumberproject.org. So I think that's all for me. And uh, thank you very much for staying a little bit longer and uh, bearing with all the information you've just received. And uh, shouldn't say bearing with, should I? I should say it's an opportunity to continue your practice and to keep in touch with spiritual friends. Spiritual friendship is a whole of the spiritual practice. So I'm very, very grateful to each one of you. And also wish to thank the co-hosts, Manori, who is also our treasurer, and Matthias, who's been doing the recording. I'm sure he's still here. And also Gunter, who was here. I'm not sure if he disappeared throughout the course of this retreat, but uh, Annie as well, who's my bookings volunteer and has been helping with the Q&A. And of course, Venerable Pekka, who's sitting by my side. So she's waving goodbye. And it would be kind of nice if the other people in the room could come away wave goodbye. <laughs> so now you get to see the people who've been feeding us, looking after us and practicing together mm -hmm. with us. So this is Tabs and Leone and Leo and uh, and again, Pachala, <laughs> here they all are, waving at you. Yay. <laughs> That's really sweet, isn't it? <laughs> 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 Bye. <laughs> Bye. Take care, everybody.